Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Mitchell Askew. He's the head analyst at Blockware Solutions, an industry leader in Bitcoin mining services, which includes a marketplace to buy or sell your own hosted Bitcoin mining rigs. He's also the host of their podcast called Blockware Intelligence. Welcome, man. How is it uh, to be on the other side? Yeah, thanks for having me. I I'm excited. You know, I'm definitely used to preparing for the interview by like, gather questions and researching the guests so it's nice to just come on here and i can just let it rip nice man yeah well i researched you we just talked off mic that i absolutely love that you're living the like young person's <laughs> meme in real life i saw your living room it's your desk your <laughs> your monitor and a chair uh and and you said the main reason is that you can just stack more sets so uh, <laughs> i think you're yes, doing sir. well it's uh there's a high opportunity cost for me and the way it it's it's funny, right? Like I have a mattress that sits on the floor and I have a desk for doing work and that's pretty much the only furniture because I want to stack Bitcoin. But also part of the reason is because I'm really focused right now. We've got the halving coming up. You know, there's going to be a massive bull market. I'm in like go mode right now. I'm trying to prepare as much content and work as much as I can before that comes. And so like if I it may sound silly, but like, I'm not going to buy a TV and a couch because I just frankly don't have time to relax. Like there's no time to relax right now because <laughs> this bear market's not going to last forever. So we need to be prepared. Yeah, I know this feeling. We'll talk about this later, but I saw you start your Bitcoin journey in like 20, 2020. Like I've been in Bitcoin up, up and down, I have to say for 10, for 10 years. Um, but like this, this like time frame before the halving, and especially now when you see, you know, people are paying attention again. Uh, I'm getting messages again from my friends, like, "Hey, where where do I buy Bitcoin?" You know, like this is that time again. Um, I actually orange built my uh, girlfriend, so she has some Bitcoin, which I'm super proud of, of course. But this is like her first real like halving. Uh, uh, you know, time frame, same for you, right? And like every every mm -hmm. time, like uh, or like today, the price went down a bit, like uh, like low thirty five. Now it's like mid thirty seven. You know, and she's like, oh, I was down this morning, but now I'm up again. You know, and then like like this whole feeling of um, suspense, I almost want to say, you know, like it's just so much fun. Like I and and you as well. You know, you know what you have, and I know what I have, and I know what this is going to be and it's just really fun so i love that you're like tuned in and ready for it because uh yeah it's just it's just fun like it's great like if you know what you have then you will really enjoy yes, this sir. time period yeah of, uh, we wouldn't have made it this far if we, if we yeah we wouldn't have made it this far if we didn't understand yeah. what it is we're holding i would have capitulated long mm -hmm. ago but thankfully you know we put in the work so we're still here still hanging. yeah that's great man i i love that you're so young and you see it and you're into it. And uh, yeah, that's great, man. Like I, I, one of the things I want to ask you, so, so obviously you're not a millennial, you're a bit younger, you're, you're, you're part of Gen Z. Like what is, what's your experience helping your uh, generation understand Bitcoin? Right. So I'm, I'm Gen Z. I was born in 2000, 23 years old. And to be honest, and this may surprise people, but I've noticed like, not a lot of my peers are into it, despite the fact that we're the first real digital generation. Social media really became popular when I was in middle school, early high school. We've grown up using computers our whole lives. And despite that, this idea of like digitally native money just hasn't seemed to click with a lot of my peers. And I think mostly it's because everyone is very, very high time preference. I know it's super cliche to talk about that in Bitcoin, like everyone mentions it, but mm -hmm. it's true. A lot of people my age, they're not focused on saving and planning for the long term. Even really, some of them aren't even focused on having like a career. It's a lot of just, what can I do this weekend to have a good time? There's, there's a lot of that, that attitude out there. And that type of person doesn't see the need for Bitcoin, right? Especially someone who's living paycheck to paycheck, you know, inflation is high, right? You would think that would be an indicator. Hmm, I need to find a way to to combat that. But people are really more so just 
sort of struggling financially and they don't have any savings, right? And if you don't have any savings to begin with, then saving in Bitcoin doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's that's not really mm-hmm. a need for that, right? I think the wealthier you are, the the more you need Bitcoin to an extent, which may sound counterintuitive, but when you don't have any savings, there's nothing to protect. So I think, you know, in in my experience working in Bitcoin too, a lot of the people are are your age, more so millennial, and then even a little older, Gen X. So I have a hard time communicating it to my peers. My close friends get it because they they're actually around me enough to to start to learn and to absorb. But it takes a lot of time to yeah. understand Bitcoin, as you know. And a lot of people my age have really short attention spans. That's why TikTok's so popular, YouTube Shorts, etc. So. You're not going to learn Bitcoin from a 15 second TikTok and people, a lot of people my age aren't willing to to dedicate the time necessary to really understand what Bitcoin is. Yeah, so what what I, I, I find it fascinating, just like you say, like you don't know anything else than the Internet, right? Then exchanging value on the Internet, paying for stuff or having like items in games and stuff like that. But. Is that, and I also want to get into that later because you're also really like into this this kind of like philosoph uh, philosoph uh, how do you say like uh, philosophy approach to Bitcoin, right? Why 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 do Gen Zers have this like short time preference? You think like is that all external, right? Like you say, it's 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 how they consume content and stuff, or is it also I don't know like educational? Uh, progress yeah. or like how, how how do you view that it's an interesting question i think certainly the way we consume content is is a big part of it we're not watching like long like three hour movies with high like a lot of deep themes right it's more like oh the new marvel movie that's an hour and a half and it's just like action and like flashes so there's that element to it and then Perhaps like the educational system could play a big role in that, right? Just you're stuck in mm-hmm. school for eight hours a day. You have to ask permission to use the bathroom. You're just sitting there and you do this for basically your entire formative years. I think that that definitely, and I mean, a lot of what they do is they put these kids on Adderall t- because they're not I- enjoying that environment, obviously. And they think it's something wrong with the child when really it's it's the environment that you're putting them in. But, you know, when I think of, when I say it out loud, like the school system has been that way for decades. So maybe that's not necessarily a a unique problem with, with generation Z, but I think, yeah, it's gotta be the, the rise of the internet, right? Because even your, your generation, you didn't have TikTok when you were in high school, right? You actually had time for your brain to develop without these, these apps and these algorithms that are designed to capture your attention. Attention is like oil in this economy, right? It's it's a valuable commodity. If you mm. can get someone using your app and keep them on there, you can make a lot of money. So they design these things like a casino. Like TikTok, if you I don't have TikTok, but I know if you go on on a TikTok and you start scrolling, like each video is specifically designed to try and keep you on the app. I know personally from going on YouTube, if I click on the home page, there's going to be a thumbnail and a title that is appealing to me. These algorithms have it down pat to keep you there. Yeah. And it, take, it takes yeah. a certain level of discipline to break free from, I, I, I hesitate to call it like the chains of the internet, but there's a certain mm. amount of that. And obviously it has its pros, right? Because you and I can communicate and we can dive deep on Bitcoin. You can go on the internet and learn all sorts of different topics. I've got a buddy who, who remodels houses for a living. He never went to school. He never had anybody show him how to do it. He's learned everything from YouTube. So there's an infinite amount of pros, but it comes with these cons of an infinite amount of dopamine readily available at your fingertips. And it takes a certain type of person to be able to resist just falling into like the web of yeah. of nothing content. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Like you can obviously also use it for your education, right? Because I think compared to my youth where first there wasn't internet and then there was right like when i was i'd say like 11 12 ish we had like the dial-up internet at home and i was always like 
uh, trying to find like new things to learn about. Like in, in general, I like to do that, but that took that, that took a long time before it developed, obviously, right? But for your generation, like you can learn anything. Like I, I, I think I think I'm one of the people that thinks like college or university is only there's only the social part there almost, right? And the what you can learn is already free on the internet and and in some ways way better than um a politically colored university you know whatever whatever site um so it has to be more than where people consume content right like what you say it, it's 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 kind of your personality like are you curious or are you just okay with how life is or something or maybe you lack like the perspective to think bigger or outside of i don't know the the construct or something like what do you think about that yeah i mean it's definitely i think the way the education system designed in as it is is like to breed employee type of people versus more like entrepreneurial outside of the box thinking and you talked you mentioned universities and i agree a lot of it is the social aspect and it used to be like the credentials of it, right? If you have a college degree, that actually meant something. You went there, you learned how to critically think, you're qualified to do some sort of job and you have some skill set, but it's not like that. I graduated in 2022 and I can, I've witnessed firsthand a lot of these kids, they, a lot of the classes to begin with are pointless and then nobody's paying attention. Everybody's just partying and there's not really any critical thinking. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Kids are just showing up, you know, to their 9 a.m. lecture hungover with a jewel pod and like just in sweatpants, like not they don't care at all. Mm. A lot of the professors don't really care. And then the material that's being taught is from a textbook that's like two decades old, irrelevant to the modern world. And and so you get, you know, the last decade, every basically like half the population has gone to college. So now the degree is just so watered down. Even when you graduate, it doesn't really guarantee you anything. Not that it should either, right? Because you're not, most of these people aren't doing anything productive, definitely not critically thinking, right? So I think, Hmm. I don't know how we make the world more curious. I I think maybe it's just something you're born with, like certain types of people are curious and, and willing to think outside the box and others aren't. I'm trying to think if there's like any way that we could change that from a macro level, right? I guess it really comes down to the individual. Yeah, I think it comes down to the individual, but only after you get taught something or shown something, right? Like I have a young young child myself, like I am his truth, right? Like he asks me questions, like how does this work or how does that work? Or when they explain something in school and he thinks it's different, then he asks me and we have a discussion about it, right? So I think in general, most kids are at least like that right and of course like he's also on an ipad sometimes which well, i'm still debating <laughs> but um eventually it's also about what is shown to you i would say as like this is the world or something or these are all the things that you can learn or there's all these different types of people that think all these different types of things you know and um you know, this person could say this thing and that person could say that thing and that can both be interesting, right? It's not a battle and stuff like that. So I think, yes, it's personal, but also at a younger age, probably what has just been shown to you. But perhaps that goes back. And and then, you know, we are obviously also talking about America and a certain type of education or how that's how that's created. Yeah, I think this is also like a rabbit hole, right? Like yeah. go really, really, really deep down in this. But I, I, I'd I, like to understand like, so where where does your interest come from? Like you, your journey started around 2020. Um, yes, sir. What was like your turning point or or aha moment in, in that journey that influenced your perspective on this? Yeah, definitely. And I'll say that was a good point because ch- young children are very curious. So it has to be something about the environment because every child I've ever met is just like always asking questions about everything, you know, wanting to know how it works. Mm. So I guess at some point in adolescence, a lot of that uh, goes away for many people. My Bitcoin journey, yeah, like you mentioned, it began in 2020. And I spent a lot of the summer of 2020 after I 
they send us home from university for the lockdowns and everything. I spent a lot of that summer listening to Thomas Sowell and like other classical economics guys. I didn't f- discover the Austrian economics yet, but after a month, what of did that, you study? So it was Thomas Sowell. He's this uh, African American mm-hmm. conservative economist, and I listened to hit, like hours of his podcast, basically talking about free markets and why they're superior to central planning and a lot of the problems with like racial tension in America and how it sort of dissolved and how the family structure is actually really one of the most important foundational pieces to to an economy. And after months of listening to him, I had this sort of foundational, you know, I understood free markets are the way to go. And then I realized what they did in March 2020. At the time I wasn't paying attention, right? But slowly the Bitcoin price started to trickle up. It caught my attention. And then I did a little bit of research and I saw exactly what they did. I'm like, okay, so they just printed a bunch of money. This thing that is scarce and cannot be printed is probably going to appreciate in price. And we're probably going to get price inflation on goods and services, which is exactly what happened in, in 2021 and 2022. So it was really the, you know, the massive money printing that caught my eye, coupled with Bitcoin's number going up, and then sort of the icing on the cake for me and this may sound like crazy or radical, or whatever was the 2020 election. I was completely convinced that it was rigged and I just lost all trust in institutions at that point. Maybe it was rigged, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. And at this point, I don't really care. Since going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, I've really separated like from politics. I just don't pay attention nor, <laughs> nor do I like give one out who's in the, op, uh, 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 in the Oval Office. I don't think it matters. I think the central bankers are the real problem. But that that sort of concoction of money printing, studying free market economics, and then losing trust in institutions is a perfect storm for wanting to to figure out what Bitcoin is and then kind of falling in love with it and falling down the rabbit hole. Nice, man. Well, when I was your age, I wasn't thinking about that. So <laughs> I, I do think, well, from my perspective, right, and like I'm not an old man yet, but I think I'm older and I do I do see that like, in the younger generation, like sometimes, like I've been on TikTok or like first time I opened Snapchat, I didn't even understand like the UI, right? It's purposefully made for younger people, right? To understand. <laughs> but what I like is that, or well, what I like, I, I don't know if it's good, but I think like we just talked about like the Gen Z that are kind of like chewed out. They don't know what to do. You know, they're on their jewel and all day and uh, looking at TikTok. But then the other side is kind of like people like you, right? Who do follow this kind of like philosophical path. They study different stuff. They have an open like growth mindset, um, you know, and just trying to figure out like what is going on here and and what do I think of it, you know? And so I see this kind of like dichotomy, um, but there there seems to be not a lot in the middle. I don't want to go back to the part where we talked about Gen Z, but I find it like it triggers me when I hear like <laughs> you and I think about me at my age or a bit younger, Right, like I do see that different difference in your generation, where there are also quite a few like young Gen Zers who are pretty grown up in a sense already. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I I see that dichotomy too when I look at health in America. You've got the most obese people in the world on one side, and then you have other people who are like diehard into fitness, like that is their life. So uh, yeah. There's like a lot of different dichotomies in the West. It's almost like, I don't know what's the wedge. Maybe we could say it's fiat money, but something is driving society in two different directions. Even if you look at at it on a geographical basis, you've got your big cities and a certain type of people live there. And then you go an hour outside of these big cities into rural America, and that's just a completely different world. And so- same with these, mm. like the curiosity of, of Gen Z. Like you've got guys like me and then you have like other people that just don't pay attention to anything bigger than themselves. Yeah. And so when you found Bitcoin, you're still down the rabbit hole. You got a job at a Bitcoin company. Like how, how has it changed your approach to building wealth or investing the money that you earn with your job? Like how... Did you have ideas about that before or did you really create those ideas starting with Bitcoin? Yeah, I definitely created them starting with Bitcoin. I had like a Roth IRA and I had like tinkered around buying some stocks, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I was just like 
it wasn't like a lot of money in there at all to begin with. And I really didn't start saving anything or planning for the future financially at all until I discovered Bitcoin. I would just spend the money that I made and I wasn't worried. I also had this like false delusion. I think a lot of people have when they're in college is like, oh, I'm guaranteed like a high paying job right out of college. So I'll worry about money then. Not exactly the case. And so I spent basically my last well, we year see of college. The videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like I got a yeah. hundred eighty thousand dollar marketing degree and I'm rolling sushi uh, <laughs> because I cannot yeah. you know, I can only find like a social media intern job or something like that. Yeah, I, I know exactly which video you're talking about. There's a lot of people like that. I've I was actually talking about this yeah. with a buddy of mine yesterday. Like all these people from my high school that, you know, they went to these nice universities and they were, you know, valedictorian in high school and now they're just like three, four years out of college, still haven't found a job. It's surprising how many people are like that. Mm. But anyway, so I spent my entire last year of college like trying to develop a skill set that I could market to Bitcoin companies and <laughs> low key like shit posting on Twitter is pretty much how I got my start. <laughs> but slowly I've been able to develop more more marketable skill sets, just working at Blockware. It's a, so we're a Bitcoin mining startup and anybody who's worked at a startup knows you have to wear a bunch of different hats. So I feel like I've been able to learn on hyper speed. I've been working with Blockware for almost two years now, but it feels like I have six, seven years of experience. And I've been able to learn from a lot of really smart guys like Will Clemente used to work at our company and Joe Burnett, who's now at Unchained. Getting to work closely with those guys taught me a lot about Bitcoin and like, on-chain analytics, Bitcoin mining, and just how the entire industry works. Coupled that with getting to listen to all these Bitcoin podcasts, like the guys like Preston Pish and just learning how the macro works. I've learned so much since I graduated college, just working in Bitcoin and consuming Bitcoin content. Like I probably learned more in the last year and a half than I did in like the four years prior. Very cool. Yeah. And so you are someone who started saving with Bitcoin. This is how you learned about it or created like your own approach. If other, well, there's a lot of millennials listening. I can actually now see all the stats and stuff. And so I see I'm actually reaching millennials. So, that, so that's nice, great. Yeah. But like the millennials that are listening and also also younger and perhaps also older, like how, how do you view Bitcoin as a long-term like investment or saving vehicle and how do you tie that to like its finite nature like what is your view on that like how, how do you see that yeah to me bitcoin is the only safe long-term investment because you can buy a stock and there's an infinite number of things that can go wrong with that company between now and when we're ready to retire in a few decades you could buy real estate and that jurisdiction can just go completely crazy, pass insane taxes, pass insane laws, not be tough on crime and just turn into an absolute hellhole. Case in point is like San Francisco or Los Angeles or Brooklyn, all these places that are just rampant with crime. Gold has been manipulated for centuries, millennia with just paper gold, all this crap out there in the gold market. You don't want government bonds or any sort of fiat derivative because that's not going to keep up with the debasement of the currency. So literally the only thing you're left with is Bitcoin because we know with Bitcoin, there's no counterparty risk. There's nobody who can come in and screw things up. It's going to be a block every 10 minutes and it's going to be you know 6.25 Bitcoin per block now. That's going to drop in five months. Four years after that, that's going to drop again, right? There's only a few like handful of things in life that we know for certainty will happen. We know every day the sun's going to come up and then the sun's going to set. We know that humans are probably going to corrupt institutions, right? Anytime a group of humans get together, something inevitably gets corrupted there. We know that the sky is blue and we know that Bitcoin will never have more than 21 million. So, And we also know that <laughs> fiat currency, the supply of that, has to mathematically increase in order to service the debt. So every other asset just has these clouds of uncertainty around it that aren't there with Bitcoin. And if you're planning yeah. for the long term, you need something like Bitcoin that is just immune to all this, the just constant changes in the world, something that's rock solid that can't be messed with. 
Yeah, I I see it exactly the same. That that's not a surprise, I think. But what I find so interesting is that in your short answer, I think you explained it perfectly, actually, and that it's not even about you. Don't, I think you don't even have to mention Bitcoin, right? Like if you say this is how it is right now. These are all like the options that you could use to save your mon- um, you know, your your energy, your value into the future through space and time. This is how they are corrupted or could be changed, or like these are all the external factors that can influence your personal risk decision after you actually took the decision, right? That's all outside of your you know, circle of influence. What if there's a thing that just is? That will always be there. That just works. Even if there's two, well, satellites, we now have satellites running the the network, right? So it will always be there unless someone, you know, sends a rocket and shoots it out of space. (laughs) So it's just the protocol. It's just the thing. It's just there. We know how it works. Everyone can use it. If you want to use it, you just follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, you cannot use it. Does that, does, uh, you know, it's way more transparent. It's auditable, uh, you know, 24-7, 365. Like, does that sound better than your current options? You know, if yes, then the answer, you know, and then you say that's <laughs> that's Bitcoin, right? <laughs> and I find it so fascinating that when you put these two things together, like in, in just, I think, I, I also think Bitcoin is not about intelligence and stuff like that, but it's like a rationale thing, right? Like, is it, do you want this? Or do you want the other thing? And if you say I want I want the current thing, then you know, fine. I don't think you can like pull those people into Bitcoin, right? Like they have to think it's not okay, and then they they look at uh, like o- other options, you know, or something else they could do. But if there's people who think like, hmm, okay, you know, that that new thing, that other thing, that alternative thing that is way more transparent and open and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that sounds more interesting than in my mind. That should be like a huge trigger for people to start studying, right? But also in my experience, there's a lot of people who say like, well, yeah, okay, you know, the current thing is a nuisance or, you know, whatever. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really feel the problem. And when you were answering the question, I was thinking about this, that this is my experience, but I, I have the exact same experience as what you described with your generation in the sweatpants and the jewel. Like, it's just like, it's like oblivious or something, right? They are... Or, is it oblivious or ignorant? I don't know what's the right word. But like, it's like it feels not real to them. Like, like life does not feel real to them, or something, right? Like as if it's not happening to them when, when you, how do you say, like describe like something negative or something that, you know, in your example, you know, well, you should put in the time to learn things and then you find what you enjoy and you know your life gets better etc etc like it feels like life is they are not part of life or something i don't know i'm rambling a (laughs) bit but i just i i I find it fascinating because it is very simple it's like do you want a or do you want b if you don't want a you want b right and then if you want b you have to study obviously um there's not really a question in there, but I think it's just yeah, no, fascinating I, uh, how basic you can make I, it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the type of people you're describing, I think <laughs> that may be where the term NPC originated because they, it does feel <laughs> well, like they're, they're simply not part of life. And I guess as the fiat system just continues to get worse and worse because it's not getting better, you'll see people just adopt Bitcoin because they don't have a choice. Right now, we do Mm. have option A and option B, right? Option A, fiat, slowly lose your purchasing power over time. Option B, Bitcoin, have to take a little personal responsibility, endure some volatility, but in the long run, you preserve your uh, time and energy. You preserve your economic energy across time. But as you and I both know, option A is changing from lose a little bit of wealth over time to lose a moderate amount of wealth over time to inevitably lose a lot of wealth in a very short amount of time. That's the end state of every fiat currency. So as option A just gets pushed further and further on that spectrum, people are just, they're going to get left behind. And the only thing standing will be option B, which is Bitcoin. Could it make more sense, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) And so what are like the most common 
like counter arguments you face when when you advocate for Bitcoin with the people who are open to to hearing what <laughs> right. you're spending a lot your of it time on is either like doomsday scenario like what good does bitcoin do me if everything goes to chaos there's nuclear war so with yeah. that i mean i don't really have a great response it immediately you're gonna want water you're gonna want beef and bullets and shelter but the point i'll add to that is eventually economies and societies recover right we can we've had massive wars but eventually with the government like if their hands off, the economy will start to recover. Some money will emerge from that. It's going to be Bitcoin because that'll be the only thing left standing. And then the other sort of counter argument I get from people who are open minded enough is just lack of technical knowledge, right? They don't understand how it works. And so therefore, it sort of shies them away. They, they don't understand why Bitcoin can't be changed, why the 21 million supply cap can't be changed. They don't really understand the concept of decentralization and the fact that there is nobody in charge. But to that, I always say, you go and you swipe your credit card and you have no idea how that works on the back end. I barely have any idea. We're using this <laughs> program to, to record our podcast. No idea how it works. The a no, a lack of knowledge on a technical side doesn't stop technologies from getting adopted yes. we all drive cars not all of us are mechanics or engineers we all fly on planes none of us are pilots none of us are aerospace engineers so that's what i always say to that and that usually gets a, a head nod and like aha uh -huh, i never thought about it like that yeah it's funny i actually uh, had a conversation today where um we talked about like even in a very positive message people can find the negative even in a negative message, they can find a positive and a negative thing, right? Like, so, so you can say some negative stuff and then still, you can still, you know, split that even into positive and negative again. <laughs> so maybe this is like one of those examples, right? Where it's like, yeah, well, I, I, I don't fully understand it. So I, I'll, I'll, I have to comment something, right? Or I have to, right. um, you know, go, go against this, this crazy positive story that Mitch is telling me here. Yeah, and um, that's how yeah, I started yeah. in, uh, in Bitcoin. Ahead. And I'm sure you're probably the same way. It's, it is a lot of like, this thing seems too good to be true. Like, I have to be missing something. This has to be a scam in some sort of way. I got to figure out what that is. And I think that's ultimately what the Bitcoin rabbit hole is. It's like, continually trying to prove your initial hypothesis wrong yes. and just never finding that yes. evidence. 100%. I actually read the uh, tweet today uh, that was quote tweeting like Michael Saylor. Michael Saylor said, there are no informed critiques to Bitcoin. That sounds so crazy, right? It sounds outrageous. Like, duh, of course you would say that when you are into something. I have not seen them either. They are not there, right? Like if you're an if you're an intellectual, curious, open-minded person, you will you will fall into this rabbit hole because there are so many dimensions that any of these people can like touch and and start with learning about Bitcoin. That yeah, like I agree with that. There are no informed critiques. It's, right. it's all very superficial. It's feeling, it's ignorance or not knowing, but then still wanting to have like a discussion, right? But I do experience that when I say something like this, like I had a discussion with a guy I know in real life on uh, on Twitter and he uh, he's like a PhD somewhere. Like he's very smart. I know he's very, very smart and intellectual and he likes to learn new things and stuff like that. And I tweeted something about Bitcoin. He quote tweeted me like, oh, why are all the Bitcoiners always saying like, oh, it's so amazing. Like, I, uh, he thinks it's crap. And I just replied to him and I couldn't even believe that I was saying it. But I was saying like, dude, I know you. You are very smart. You are intellectually curious. I can honestly say you don't know enough to have this opinion. Like you are wrong. So I, I suggest to you like study more because I know you can understand this. Like, and even now when I repeat it, I think like, it sounds so like audacious, right? Like it sounds so kind of like superior. Like I, I am smarter than you, but it's totally not what I mean. I know it sounds like that, but I, I, I mean it like really from, I think like even a loving way, like, dude, you can <laughs> understand this too. Even like, I think he's smarter than me. Right. So 
that is actually what I mean. But there's there's almost no different way to say it, right? Like I'm trying to trigger him also in a way. Like, yeah, you know, why is why is Bram saying this to me? Like, does he really? You know, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I find yeah, it no, very, you, you responded to that in a, a friendlier way than I would have. I would usually just say, like, <laughs> come back, come back when you can explain the difficulty adjustment or something like that. But you're spot on, dude. There are no informed critiques. And there, I will say this there are past, like, quote unquote, former Bitcoiners, but only the only former Bitcoiners that exist is because they've had their incentives warped by greed basically right you've got like a brian armstrong for example like he understood bitcoin he got it but he wanted to make money selling shit coins so that's what he peddles or like a gary gensler who used to give these lectures on bitcoin's a commodity and now he's like (laughs) who knows what what he believes i followed it (laughs) actually yeah yeah so you don't really have like Like it's their their personal incentives changed right but it's not that is not critique against Bitcoin. Yeah, there was nothing that there was no new piece of information that they discovered that made them think Bitcoin's not what you and I think it is. It's just they found a different way to make money that yeah. involves promoting false narratives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why where I do get like kind of triggered when I see like these Greenpeace people have like presentations where it's just like you are spending like donated money to spread misinformation or it's disinformation actually based on studies that have been debunked like 10 times already you know like that is malicious in a sense right like they they are following a certain agenda and they know they are wrong like i don't they're they are very stupid if they think they're right you know so i think they're smart enough to do this on purpose um like that is what triggers me but i do think that you know, even Michael Saylor, you know, one of the largest holders of Bitcoin, like he tweeted, like, I don't I don't know the exact tweet, but like Bitcoin is nothing. It's going to die or whatever. And uh, like in, in 2014, 15 ish or something. And now he's one of the biggest holders. Right. So I think everyone starts at a point similar to that. Right. You don't understand. You see all these people. You think like you are smarter than these people. They are all idiots or cult believers or whatever, right? And then something triggers you, right? Like you hear, at least for me, like I hear people who I think, I heard people who I think are very smart that I respect. And that at one point they talked about Bitcoin and that triggered me when I felt like, okay, I respect this person. I know they're smart. I know they're, you know, inquisitive and stuff like that. And why, why do they talk about this? right if if they talk about this maybe i should look at it too right and so i ho- i just hope that i can be that for some people hopefully in a nice way i try like on yeah. twitter but i think it's just a pity it's a it's a waste of inte- yeah like intellect of these people that they focus on the negative instead of spending time to try to understand why other people are so adamant about this right yeah, I I could not agree more. That was certainly a tipping point for me. I I heard people talking about Bitcoin. The people that really seemed to get it, I admired their intelligence. I'm like, wow, these these guys are really smart. All these smart people are are into this orange coin thing. I should probably figure out what it is yeah. and try to catch what up. What is going on? <laughs> yeah. So now you work at a Bitcoin company, right? What's it like working with other Bitcoiners at a Bitcoin company? <laughs> Dude, it's awesome. I could not imagine doing anything else. One of my favorite parts is whenever there's like a a good day for price action and the vibes in the company chats are just immaculate. But on like a more serious note, I've been able to learn so much from these guys. Like our CEO, Mason Joppa, he founded this company in 2016 or 2017. Like he's been through the bull and the bear cycles. He's seen it all. Um, our chief investment off- officer, Sam, he, he used to trade on Forex uh, on Wall Street for like four years. The, I'm working with a bunch of really, really smart people and just trying to soak in as much information as I can. And working specifically in Bitcoin mining has really opened my eyes. And I think mining is almost a separate, you've got the orange pill and then you have the mining pill. And there's two mining pills almost. There's There's like Mining is a profitable way to earn more Bitcoin. And then there's mining as it pertains to the energy grids. And we can unpack each of these separately. Mm. Let's let's start with the second one, right? 
Bitcoin mining's impact on energy grids is something like like nothing else. And I had no knowledge of anything about energy grids before I worked in Bitcoin mining, which is a shame because we're all I've got this light plugged in, I've got that light on, I've got those Christmas lights on, I've got my computer plugged in. We're all using energy all the time, but nobody stops to think about what's going on behind that. This energy this that's coming from my light, it's not being like produced on the spot because I can call it or turn it off on demand, right? So it has mm -hmm. to already be, it's already being produced and it's just being redirected, right? So energy companies, they have this problem of they don't know what demand is going to be. Demand's gonna be the highest in the hottest days of the year around five or six o'clock when people get home from work, they're running their air conditioning, they're cooking, they're doing laundry, et cetera. That's when demand is the highest. But throughout the rest of the year, demand is less than that. And if you're producing a bunch of energy and there aren't people there to buy it immediately, you're wasting a ton of energy. You're unprofitable. But on the other side of that, when demand is the highest, you want to be able to service that. You don't want to have rolling blackouts on the hottest or coldest days of the year. So this mismatch between supply and demand is a constant question mark for energy companies. But Bitcoin mining steps in and completely fixes that because it consumes so much power that you can have a base load, but it also has the flexibility to turn off, right? All other large power consumers are hospitals or manufacturing plants or like Amazon web data centers. These types of businesses cannot turn off. Definitely not hospitals. You don't want <laughs> hospitals need power. If anything <laughs> in the world needs power the most, it's hospitals. Like manufacturing plants, they can't halt production from 100% to 90% to 80%. It has to go to 100% to 0%. And they're not going to want to do that. Same with Amazon like Web Services or like a Google Cloud. They don't want to turn off their servers and not be able to provide a product, right? But Bitcoin miners, they can unplug for a little while. It's, it's no harm, no foul, right? And they sign these power purchase agreements where they're even contractually obligated to turn off power when demand reaches a certain point. But because ASICs all consume effectively the same amount of power, they don't have to turn off 100% to 0%. They can unplug exactly as much as needed to give back to the yeah. grid at any moment. But they also are there to buy anything that gets overproduced and isn't bought by re retail consumers. So this completely just distorts, in a good way, the incentives for energy producers. They can produce as much as they need to, and they know Bitcoin miners will buy all of it, but also give back when the community needs it. Yeah. Well, and... You know, this is a big use case, I think, uh, in Texas, right? I don't, I don't know about other states yet, but for example, here in like Western Europe, like we have this problem somewhat. There's not enough um, like capacity on the on the network. So to to have like more companies that have like roofs with solar or more like, um, you know, wind uh, parks and stuff like that. But so what you say, I think, is relevant. How I also think about it is when you said, you know, let's say you have like a solar park, right? You invested in or you have like a wind turbine park, like you invested in the hardware, right? The hardware is there. You bought the ground or you lease it. Like there's all these costs. And what you want is like a, the, the full return on investment of that specific hardware, right? Which means, for example, for a wind turbine, <laughs> Whenever the wind blows, you want the thing to turn, right? Yeah. But sometimes you see wind turbines that are are standing still, and then people think like, "Well, why why is it standing still?" And that's exactly also why you said like, when they turn, like you cannot save the energy, right? Like I once read that if you put all the batteries in Europe together, you can save ten seconds of energy. Right? <laughs> so so we we are not able to save the electric energy. But when it's standing still, you're not optimizing your ROI, right? Because there's no, well, maybe, well, it costs some energy to turn it, but whatever. Like there's no, there's no output uh, for the investment that you already made. That's already done and in the books, right? So what I don't understand, because from a business case perspective, if the thing can turn whenever the wind blows and there is some demand like on the grid from people, you direct all the energy to the people. And if there's no demand or low demand, then you, you, you put it in the miners, then you have a full return on the investment on the hardware plus the return in Bitcoin. So it's like a above 100% um, ROI, right? 
and for me that makes so much sense but i don't understand why it's not, why it's not happening you know like the money is already spent so yeah. why wouldn't you do everything in your power to get the highest return possible that's just it makes yeah, no it, sense it, it, you, why, you, why you hit the nail on the head there's there's zero reason to not do that because uh, i mean if it's a really windy day you're probably way overproducing what is needed so just mine Bitcoin with the surplus. Like there, there's no reason not to. I guess at this point yeah. it's a lack of education, but that will change because the incentive is just simply too powerful. Yeah, I I agree, and especially with you know all the countries that want to be more green and and all these things. Yeah, I love I love this environmental like mining angle, maybe the most out of all the dimensions that could help people to kind of be triggered and investigate. Right, like I think. That I, I don't have to tweet in front of me, but I tweeted like last week, like if you're a real progressive, if you identify yourself as a progressive person who wants to like improve the climate, you know, and uh, hates that the banks uh, get cheap money and fund shit that destroys the planet. If you are that type of person, you have to study Bitcoin. Like if you are not studying Bitcoin, you are not, you are really doing something wrong. You know, like it's just, it's, it's just, fake you know like just like this people that i saw at um uh there was this video that went viral with jerome powell where there were these protesters <laughs> yeah. with the flags and they're screaming like oh you you do inflation or blah whatever they're screaming like stop doing that go home study bitcoin and tell all your progressive friends right like go go for it yeah yeah i, I that's that the really, narrative that um, is for sure the yeah. most appealing to left-winger progressives, right? I don't think it takes a lot of mental gymnastics to get conservative right-wing people to see Bitcoin, right? If they're already sort of hostile to government intervention in markets and, in, and with high taxes, they can see Bitcoin a lot clearer. But for the left-wing progressive types, this is absolutely the framework to go because it's the only thing that makes solar and wind production profitable right all of that up until this yes. point has been reliant upon government subsidies which is not that's not the way bitcoin mining fixes that <laughs> bitcoin mining actually makes these these investments profitable and and like valid especially especially if they're already built and they're just sitting there like you might as well use bitcoin mining and that that video of jerome powell was hilarious it was it was nice to see yeah. him actually have like a human moment for once saying close the effing yeah, door. Because this dude, this dude has been a robot yeah. just like towing the line, carefully scripting every syllable that he utters from his lips so as not to move the markets too violently in one direction or the other. And to see yeah. him have a moment like that, it's like, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And also to round that up, like about this... Um, you know, pro progressives and climate and 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 a green energy tech. Like, it's also ironically the fact that all these projects start and they're already paid for and they are not turning is the symptom of the the horrible fiat currency, right? Like, it is the 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 perfect example of all this money is spent to appease all the voters that want to be green and climate, but we are not fully using, <laughs> using yeah. them, right? Like that's just it's a perfect a malinvestment example. example fiat, yeah. fiat fuckery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Funny. Yeah. Funny. I, I like by now I can just laugh about it. Like, I think it's just, that's also, I think uh, what I love about the Bitcoin ethos. And uh, I talked, I talked about this before a lot, like in Bitcoin, it's, you understand you have to walk the talk. You cannot just talk. If you just talk, it's BS, right? Like you have to walk the talk or just yeah. shut up. Like that sounds maybe a bit radical for some people listening, but that is what you see. Because if you just talk, if you just put up your banner and you scream at some uh, stupid meeting of Jerome Powell, like there's a trillion TikToks that people see after that video and they already forget what you did. So there's no... There's no impact. The real impact is when you just understand what's really going on and yeah. then you move out of the system that's facilitating that, right? That was really well said. Bitcoiners do walk the walk, right? You can see it verifiably on chain for one. When we say hodl, we're actually hodling. A record percent of Bitcoin hasn't moved in over a year. And then 
a lot of other people, they complain about the world should be this way. Politicians should do blah, blah, blah. They're going to protest and nothing's getting changed. Bitcoiners are taking an actionable step. When you store your wealth in Bitcoin, you are voluntarily opting out of that system. You are actually doing something yes. about and creating the world that you want. Yeah. Yeah. And for the people who think, what does he mean by that is that I talked two weeks ago, I talked to Jeff Booth and I asked about the future and he said, the future is now, you can move now, right? You can move the wealth that you have in a bank, in an old system, you can move that to the new system and then it's yours, verifiably yours. There's no third party involved anymore, right? You can do that today. And if you want to do that, and you want to do that with a substantial amount, your bank will call you and this should be a trigger for you to move on with it, right? That's the <laughs> yeah. whole point. The whole point is that they are closing the doors because they don't want you to move that money because for each dollar or euro you put in a bank, they can lend it out 10 times and put you at risk, you know, like that. I don't know if I can say that any simpler, but I think that's just how it works, right? And if you hear this and you think, hmm, that doesn't really feel okay, well, again, <laughs> you know, study Bitcoin yeah. and and go into it. But yeah, that's a good point because you don't you don't have to wait for some magical. There won't be a magical moment where the world suddenly you look up and it's a Bitcoin standard. Like we're on a Bitcoin standard right now. You and I, we both use Bitcoin as our unit of account. We, that's both where we store wealth. You don't have to wait for anyone else. You don't have to ask permission. You Man, can no just one go is and giving do you it. permission. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk about, like I found two articles you wrote for Bitcoin magazine and one was about instilling how Bitcoin instills like cardinal virtues. And I really yes, like sir. that because I, I, again, like I like your philosophical approach. Like I'm really into that th dimension of Bitcoin. Like I, um, I have some guests coming up um, like Eric Kaysen and uh, Knut Svanholm, like we're really going to like dive into that corner, which which I love. And and I love that you wrote about it. Then you discuss prudence or caution. Um, and I wanted to ask you, like, how does Bitcoin encourage prudent financial yeah. behavior? So first is you have to actually do what we've talked about pretty much this whole episode is do the work, right? You have to learn Bitcoin. You have to understand. And like, there's a level of prudence to that, right? You're thinking for the future, you're thinking, how can I save my wealth? Oh, let me learn about this Bitcoin thing. So that's prudence level one. Second, and, and for those who, who don't know what prudence means, it basically just means like thinking before you act, like very rational decision-making, being careful and, and really not just making decisions hastily. The second way is self-custody. You have to be careful. You can't just set up a wallet on a whim, not pay attention to where you keep your seed phrase, just like shove it under our mattress or something like any all sorts of things can go wrong people have lost their keys all the time so with bitcoin you really have to you have to be prudent you have to know exactly what you're doing so so as to not mess it up and lose everything and then just sort of rage quit and there's other ways uh that bitcoin sort of instills prudence too right if you leave your bitcoin on an exchange that's not you're not carefully thinking that decision you're making the lazy decision right you're doing what is simple and easy in that moment and ultimately, you will likely get punished for that, as we've seen with, with all sorts of exchanges and Bitcoin custodians that have gone bust. Yeah. And so it's interesting, right? Like I have some friends that I try to orange pill and uh, uh, one of them said like, okay, but if I have a million in Bitcoin, does that mean I... I'm the only like caretaker of that. Like it's my sole responsibility. And then I said, yeah. And then he was like, oh damn, like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Right. Because, so I, I think you're right, but I also think it's really hard for people, you know, because yeah. a lot of these things like that we talked about in the beginning, a lot is um, like extended in your circle of influence, right? You give uh, influence away your, what, how you can influence for example, your wealth, right? And now it's like a radical change. It's like, it's all on you. Yes, I 1000% agree with that. It really forces you to take personal responsibility. That That's the biggest hurdle at this point for self-custody. <clears throat> it's not that yeah. it's hard. It's not hard to keep track of a list of words, 
but it's all on your shoulders. If you mess something up, you send Bitcoin to the wrong address, you lose your keys, you get got by a scammer on Telegram and send them some Bitcoin. Like there's no unwinding yeah. it. There's no handouts to make things better. It is, it's a double-edged sword, right? You have this ultimate personal freedom from the tyranny of the banking system. But with that freedom comes the ultimate level of personal responsibility that is required to make this work. Yeah. Yeah, it's the real uh, application of uh, an integration, I'd say, of uh, the nobody is coming to save you uh, yeah. <laughs> meme almost, right? Like it's, it's, it's really like that. But I think, I think, yeah, this is one of the hardest things for people that, that you also have to understand, like, what are actually all the things where I put the responsibility outside of myself, right? Where I gave a third party the responsibility. Uh, and and therefore also the influence over you know what whatever was uh, in my own how do you say that like autonomy um, before yeah right? so I, yeah I think I, I think, think that's that, the that's the hardest yeah I think it goes back to the type of people we we're talking about earlier that just they don't take action right and they just want to complain part of you know outsourcing responsibility whether it's you know financial management or like custo custody or just any sort of scenario in which you can put the responsibility on someone else's shoulder it gives people an excuse when something goes wrong it's like oh well that guy messed it up it was his responsibility instead of like hey let's like take a little bit of ownership here you could have done that yourself right you could have you know instead of having a, a portfolio manage your wealth and, and trade stocks and they get burned like learn markets yourself trade yourself like buy Bitcoin, study mm -hmm. Bitcoin, right? So being able to yeah. outsource responsibility and deflect blame is something you we should all avoid. Yeah, well, it's one of the other things you talk about, you know, uh, when you talk about these cardinal values, because you also said, or you suggested that Bitcoin promotes fortitude. Yes, How does that yes. tie into? So fortitude this? is basically a synonym for courage and Maybe I wrote this a year ago. I don't know if necessarily I still agree with it because we have seen uh, Bitcoin really become adopted by institutions. We've seen a complete 180. It's being embraced uh, by BlackRock, like the biggest financial uh, asset manager in the world. But at the time, you know, FTX had just collapsed. There was a lot of uncertainty, right? You know, Bitcoiners were not are not were not being treated in the right way, and so. I think it, it does take a certain level of courage to be a part of this movement, especially publicly, right? You and I are both using our name and where our faces are shown. Like people with the internet, people can figure out everything about us just by our name and our faces. And so there's a level of courage with that. And because people, $5 wrench attacks are a legitimate thing. And so we're taking a risk because we want to share the word about Bitcoin. We want to educate others. And then there's the level of like nation state risk, right? We we are <laughs> vocally going against the fiat monetary system that has run this country for a hundred years. Uh, well, I guess we're in different countries, but you know the Federal Reserve has run run the world since 1913. They're not going to go down without a fight, and we're basically openly like battling against that, trying to usurp their power. And I think that takes a little level of courage, right? If we're wrong and Bitcoin fails, like you know, who knows? We might be in, in a bad position, right? I think in this article, I compared uh, Bitcoiners to the founding fathers. If the founding fathers of America lost the war, they would have been hung. They would have all been killed. That took a level of fortitude. Mm. And I think Bitcoin is, is similar in that regard. Maybe we won't knock on wood if we're wrong. We're not going to be hung. But we are exposing ourselves <laughs> to, to a certain level of, of risk by, by being so vocal and, and attaching our names and likeness specifically to it. Yeah. And so... How do you think that talking about this or sharing, um, you know, also about these virtues, how how do you think Bitcoin can can like bridge the gap between, uh, you know, the the whole uh, how do you say like, um, you know, left and right thinking, all the like binary thinking, the for and against, like the the difference in political ideologies. Um, how do you think Bitcoin can help that become better and then well especially for for our generations right yeah i think it does 
how it does, I'm not entirely sure. If I had to summarize what I think it is, I think a lot of the problems come from the fiat monetary system being broken, but the diagnosis, the right makes a certain diagnosis. Oh no, this is the source of the problem. And the left makes, you know, no, this thing is the problem where with Bitcoin, Mm. then we both realize, oh no, this is the problem. And I'm glad you brought this up because there's a a friend of mine that I, I interact with on Twitter and we met up at the Pacific Bitcoin conference. And this guy, he's like a, uh, He's a California Democrat liberal, basically, and I'm from the South, like fairly conservative, right wing. And because we both see Bitcoin, we talked for like two hours and did not disagree on a single thing. And it's like, that just blows my mind. We come from completely different backgrounds. We fundamentally, you would think we would see the world in an entirely different way, but we were aligned on literally everything. We could not find something we disagree with. And all of that's centered around bitcoin right once you realize that the money Mm. is broken you don't get these false diagnoses of what's causing problems in society and then you can pretty much align from there yeah i love that you say that it makes me think also i i think i never met a bitcoiner that i didn't like or something you know like it's it's you have a certain a certain connection but where uh, I think I think now that I quickly think of it, I think I think it's a few things. It's the do the work thing, like the walk the talk thing, right? Like I know that you had to do a lot of work before you understood this, right? Yeah. I think you and I are still trying to understand more of it every day, right? So that shows that you have like an open mind. You try to see what you don't know, right? Um, I saw this quote last week. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like uh, it was about enlightenment, you know, or like the path to enlightenment is accepting or knowing that you don't know everything, something like that, you know. And when you know that you don't know everything, that could be scary in the beginning, right? Like, I don't know shit. (laughs) And there's a lot going on here. Um, So that could be scary. But once you just accept it, then like all these doors open, right? Yeah. Because you know, you know that in the, and this has how I tied back to Bitcoin, like in the human world, like you said, if something that humans use is potentially corruptible, it will be corrupted by the humans, right? Yeah. Like we cannot trust, we cannot trust ourselves, even though we try to well, enlighten ourselves more, learn more, you know, whatever, whatever you adhere to, right? But whenever a system or things that people can use is open to be corrupted, it will be corrupted, right? Like I, I, I just think that's true. So that's why we need for the most important technology that we need, you know, the exchange of value between people, and especially now that we can do it like all around the world at any time of the day, with whoever we need something that is helping us to not corrupt it right it should be a protocol just like a thing that exists that we cannot mess with that forces us to comply with its rules instead of the the other way around and yeah i started somewhere with this thought i'm thinking where i went but i think i I think uh, like for me that's kind of like my quick reflection there like it's I know that you did the work to understand that. And I know that you also accepted something that I also accepted, which was hard to accept or to acknowledge, right? And yeah. I think it's it's as simple as that, maybe. Like we know we both are doing the work or something like that. Yeah. And that that is already enough. Like it shows the type of person that you are, even though that we now first meet, right? <laughs> yeah. It's proof of work, just like how the nodes know the miners did the work because they can run the knots themselves that I've know, I know you've done the work and the, the, the humility yeah. aspect is, <laughs> is there too, right? You have to, we all took, well, it's the notes thing. You did the work. <laughs> well, it's like you did the work. I did the work. That's why I know. And I agree that we can work together, you know, something yeah. like that. Exactly. And you brought <laughs> up a, a good point there. Um, about oh, what was it? I, I I lost my train of thought there. Anyways, but um, 
Yeah, it, it really is proof of work. <laughs> <Yes>. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So why do you why do you think of uh, like a philosophical approach is is important to understand Bitcoin's impact? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just remember I thought by the way it was the the humans corrupt every institution. I think yeah, no, that's spot on, right? Because fundamentally, mm -hmm. I believe we all are like we're sinful in our nature, and so humans over time they'll they'll corrupt an institution, which is why Bitcoin is so magnificent because it's not immune to to human corruption. Sorry. What was your question again? I. I had to just get that one out there. No, that's great. I love I love that you remembered that. Yeah, but I think like that's already uh, that's not a w w what you just repeated. Like that is not a virtue thing. It's not like you would want to not want to improve something or make something better or do it for the children or what. Like, it's just a fact that even though you think you would never do something like that, right? There's always people that would, and that's yeah. the that's the point and and it's not that they are necessarily bad people like they just i don't know like we don't you don't even have to explain it just when you accept that that will always happen that will already give you i think a lot of new found freedom in your thinking to explore well something like bit bitcoin or you know other things that you want to learn about that are perhaps different than what you you know learned yeah. um before and even yeah. systems that are built. Uh, my to, question was, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Even systems that are built to try to withstand that that nature of humans getting corrupted, like the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. federal government, set up with all these checks and balances, right? You know, the such and such branch can't do anything without the other branch, or you know, these are the rights that can't be infringed. But over time, we've seen all the rights in the Constitution pretty much get get trampled on. So. No matter how intricate the system is, over time, you know, it could be made with the best of intentions, but over time, eventually someone is going to get in there that that breaks that system. Yeah, uh, there's a good point, like about the Constitution, right? Like, obviously, I'm not an American, but sometimes I see things where I think like, oh, wow, like the, the, the legal system in the US works really great. Like, I don't really have an example, but sometimes I see something where I think like, Wow, that's actually so American, right? Like, like how how you follow the like the legal system. And I don't, like again, I don't have an example. But sometimes I see that, right? But what you just said, like about the corruptible thing, it's not that uh, the constitutional laws and and you know legal system that it's um, being made corruptible on purpose. That's not what that means. It means that through other ways people can kind of like um how do you say that like make certain legal stuff abstract they can abstract and abstract and then they have like a little like some lawyer has some trick here and a trick there and mm. that's how they corrupt it right it's not that the base rules are changed it's kind of like playing a a, a game with endless kind of ways to to, to trick like an original rule or law. I don't know if I explained it correctly, but what I like about Bitcoin as a comparison to that, this is the set of rules, period. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there is no, there's no multiple interpretation of the rules. We cannot, we cannot play a game about the interpretation of the rules. We, it, the protocol has rules. You follow the rules or not. Like it's, it's yes or no. Right. And I think that's what the, um, uh, the the first thing is what opens up the corruptibility. If you have all these ways of interpreting and explaining, and you know that's, I think it's less harsh than saying it's on purpose. Yeah, you know? I I agree because if you think about the Constitution as like written code, and then the humans or the computers that run that code, there's it could be exploited in different ways. But Bitcoin is code. Yeah. But the computers that run the Bitcoin code, they do it exactly as it says. And there's no room for humans to sort of slip in their their interpretation. Code just runs. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, yeah. So my question was, why, why do you think a philosophical approach is important to understanding Bitcoin's impact? I think it helps make it digestible. Really big ideas. You need metaphors. You need analogies. You need parables and stories humans are very story driven people we understand stories and feelings and in ideas more than we understand really technical topics so 
the philosophical approach to Bitcoin, I think fills a huge niche and it can get kind of overblown sometimes. There's like the think boy meme. And we definitely like, none of this exists without the hardcore coders and the programmers and the people in the weeds technically. But to in order for Bitcoin to be digested by the masses, you have to break it down into to things that people can understand. Even the white paper, as like simple as, as it is, it's still going to be above the heads of a lot of people. Like that's not, if you've never consumed any Bitcoin content and you tried to read the white paper, you're going to have a difficult time understanding how it works. But, you know, videos and like animations and comparisons and, you know, comparing Bitcoin to Monopoly, right? That's that's an analogy I've heard that makes people just sort of understand how a blockchain works, how a decentralized ledger works. So yeah, this this philosophical approach I think is is huge, and there's different spectrums to it, right? You know, Robert Breedlove goes very deep. His his ideas, you know, if you ever listen to the the Breedlove mm-hmm. Sailor series, which I'm sure you've listened to, that that one's like level ten, right? And maybe that's well, crazy. I need, yeah, that's I need to crazy. be more like a level three or four philo- Bitcoin yeah. philosopher or whatever. So it just makes everything more understandable for people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's definitely needed. Like I come from a world of like uh, startups and internet companies and I always try to adhere to, you know, like it, it, you can build anything you want, but if people don't understand why they uh should or could or can use it then yeah it's futile what you build right so you have to tell the story in a way that appeals to the person you're telling the story to right and you also have to figure out you know what levels um there are in that story as you mentioned like uh, robert breedlove and michael saylor yeah that's like (laughs) that's like a um that's like a big brain thing right same as listening to jason lowry and software Mm -hmm. um or something that adam Beck talks about like technical stuff like sometimes i start a bitcoin podcast and like halfway i just tune out because i think like this is (laughs) this is a bit above my current level so you know um i i go (laughs) i dial it back (laughs) a bit but uh yeah i think that's a great uh, that's a great answer and also um yeah, I think part of why uh, I'm making a podcast, I think also part why you're making a podcast, just trying to share, um, yeah, these yeah. different stories in, in, in different ways. Yeah. And there's no one of, um, like, Bitcoin yeah. is one of one, right? There's no apples to apples comparison to make. So you have to draw from all sorts of different, like, inspirations in order to make this seemingly understandable because it's it's one of one. It's the first Bitcoin. It's not the, you know... It's not yeah. digital gold. It's not whatever analogy people want to use. It's Bitcoin. It's something brand new. So the only way to really understand it is to try to draw from a bunch of different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully agree. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question. What's a core belief that you will never let go? I think Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us that fundam- and we're all sinners and we're all broken people. And I think fundamentally that's the most important thing to me and everything else comes secondary to that. But that being said, there are things we could do on this earth that can make us have a better experience here, right? Even though this lifetime is temporary, we're all going to pass away. There's things we could do to make it better. And I think some of those are you know, family, right? We all need to... to get married, have a lot of kids and spend time with each other and build communities. And I think another core belief is government should stay out of our lives, right? That's just other people telling you what to do. The state needs to stay out of people's lives and specifically out of people's money, right? And that's where Bitcoin comes in. It's it's my third core belief there is Bitcoin is the most actionable path to a better future. Nothing else, everything else can be corrupted by humans except for Bitcoin. It's, it's magnificent. And I guess that's, uh, that's where I'll leave it. Awesome, man. Thanks for sharing. Um, where can people follow you uh, online? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter. That's pretty much the only platform I'm on, at Mitchell Hoddle. I also do my own podcast on YouTube. You can go to uh, at Blockware on YouTube, and you'll find my podcast and some other videos that I make. 
Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. And uh, wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you for having me, Graham. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.